Hello and welcome to Kauia Health's Community Engagement Webinar. Today's Thursday, May 26, 2022. My name is Deborah Volison. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and I'm joined by Gary Herbst, Kauia Health's CEO. We have moved these webinars to monthly, so if you'll mark your calendars to the fourth Thursday of every month, um, we will be joining you um, to give you updates and tell you what's going on at Kauia Health, but that is a date change that I want you to all be aware of. During the webinar today, feel free to chat any questions or comments that you have, and we will do our best to answer them. Welcome, Gary. Yes, thank you, Deb. Deborah. Deborah, sorry. thank you. It's, Deb. it's only taken him two and yeah, a half years, but he's but he's know, figuring out got, my name. I had gotten so good at it, I can't believe I just slipped. I Deb, will tell so you, I answered to anything except you know Debbie. I, I was just going to say, I didn't yeah. call you Debbie. Yeah. So, Deborah, yeah. yes. Well, thank Deborah. you. Thank you. We've got a lot to talk about today. Yep. We're going to be um, really all over the place, but yeah. let's go ahead and um, we've got questions coming in on the chat, so we will try to get to those. Let's go ahead and start with um, the current COVID numbers at the hospital. Sure. Yeah, so we haven't met in a month. Uh, it's been a very interesting month um, where we've seen definitely the peaks and troughs of COVID. Um, it seems like it was just a, a few weeks ago that we had dropped all the way down to only having six COVID positive uh, patients in the hospital and we were certainly starting to celebrate. And um, although kind of like what we celebrated in July of 2021, when we had dropped down to four, which was kind of the calm before the storm, as all of a sudden the Delta variant came uh, roaring in and we saw our numbers quickly uh, rise. So uh, quite, haven't quite experienced uh, this month what we did back in the summer of last year, um, but certainly things have changed over the last several weeks. So um, as of today, we have 19 COVID positive adults um, that are admitted in the acute medical center and two children. So a total of 21 um, COVID positive patients are in the house. Um, but interestingly, and, and I think um, we've shared this in the past, is that still about 70% of these uh, 21 patients and most of the patients that we've been seeing um, over the last couple months are uh, have COVID as a secondary diagnosis. So it's not the reason why they're in the hospital. The other 30% um, it is COVID. That's their primary diagnosis. They're experiencing an acute respiratory um, issue, and that's what led them uh, to be hospitalized. Um, but the majority of our COVID positive patients are here for a different reason, but we do test every single patient that is admitted um, to see if they have COVID. And so that these 21 patients include those that are both here because of COVID and those that just happen to uh, have tested positive, but they're here for another reason. Now, what we don't know though, is did COVID you know, contribute to that other reason? Did it exacerbate their COPD or congestive heart failure? Or did it lead to a stroke? Did it lead to a heart attack? Which is why they're in the hospital, but they also happen to have COVID. So we really don't know that. Um, and I don't think we can know that mm -hmm. um, because there still is a lot we don't know um, about COVID. So, you know, definitely kind of concerned that our COVID numbers appear to be steadily rising, um, but good to see that, uh, that it's not really severe. Uh, only one of those adult patients are actually in the intensive care unit, and, uh, and that individual is not on a ventilator. So definitely uh, a much different experience than we had last summer and, and this past winter. Um, we do continue to be an incredibly busy hospital, and I know one of the questions that we'll talk about is what happened last week, uh, where we uh, once again declared an internal disaster called the code triage. So I'll, I'll save that for um, that question. But um, as of 7 a.m. this morning, uh, I get that daily census report. Uh, the acute medical center had an adult occupancy uh, level of 98.8%, so almost at 100% full, um, but that included 23 patients that had been admitted officially but were still holding in the emergency department uh, waiting for a bed to open up uh, upstairs where they could be um, transferred. 
Um, on a positive note, and this definitely was not what we experienced last summer, is the, the area where we do have a little bit of elbow room is in critical care. Um, so last year, you know, um, that's where we were just uh, incredibly busy is in the ICU and the ICCU uh, as we were battling, you know, patients uh, or battling the, the virus and patients that were hit hard by it. So um, of the 41 ICU beds that we have uh, on two different units, 13 of them were open this morning and of the 54 intermediate critical care unit, uh, unit beds on 3 West and 5 Tower, uh, we had nine of those 54. So interestingly, you know, maybe one or two of the 200 and something medical surgical beds, which is the majority of our, you know, 20 of our 21 COVID patients are in one of those medical surgical beds. Only one is in that ICU bed. Um, but the, the medical surgical side is where we are experiencing the real intense um, demand. So. And the last question uh, I get asked often is uh, what percentage of our employees are fully vaccinated? And remember for healthcare workers, that means you had to have the, the primary uh, series of vaccinations, either the, the two Moderna or two Pfizer or the one Johnson & Johnson. So that's the primary series. But for healthcare workers in California, not only do you have to have that, but you have to have received uh, at least one booster shot before you're considered to be fully vaccinated. So, um, so defining fully vaccinated in that way, 66% of our employees are fully vaccinated. Um, there are a number of employees that aren't yet eligible to receive that initial booster shot because it has to be five months out um, from your initial vaccination. So we do have some employees that just more recently decided to go from unvaccinated to vaccinated and had their first primary series, but they're not yet eligible uh, for that booster. So I suspect that that 66% will go up. Um, but, you know, we had about a thousand employees that chose not to get vaccinated for medical or religious belief reasons with the initial vaccination series. But even those that did get that initial series, uh, a number have decided they did not want to get a booster shot. So that, that made them go from being vaccinated now to unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated. And so they are no longer considered to be vaccinated because we actually were over 80% um, vaccinated when you didn't need the booster. So we dropped down to now 66. And now those previously vaccinated but now unvaccinated employees now are subject to that weekly or twice a week um, COVID testing. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I hope that number continues to rise, but um, we still know, you know, there's increasing skepticism out there and, and particularly when we're now seeing both fully vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, people contracting COVID. And it seems like whether you're vaccinated or not, um, you're just as susceptible to contracting it. And again, I just remind people that the vaccines were never intended, while they may have helped, you know, prevent you from getting the, contracting the virus, they really are intended to keep you from getting severely ill, hospitalized or dying of COVID. And I think that still holds true today. Okay, so you mentioned the boosters and the second booster, and so a community member wants to know if any of the information has changed regarding that second booster. No, um, and just to, to recap again, so um, anyone that is uh, age five years and older, whether you're immunocompromised or not, so literally um, anyone that's age five years or older uh, is eligible to receive a booster shot. Um, after they've received that primary series of, of vaccine. With respect to a second booster shot, um, it's adults that are age 50 and older, again, whether you're immunocompromised or not, or um, anyone over 12 years of age that um, is moderately or severely immunocompromised. So anyone over 50, or anyone over 12 that is moderately to severely immunocompromised is eligible to receive a second um, booster shot. But as of today, um, I have not heard anywhere across the nation, any employer, any industry 
that is mandating a second booster shot. Even in California, um, healthcare workers currently are not mm. mandated to get a second booster shot. That could change. I mean, we're definitely seeing uh, a rise in the number of positive cases uh, up and down the state, across the country, certainly here in Tulare County. Um, it is causing some uh, communities, counties to rethink their masking policies and go back to more strict requirements around masking. Even we are considering doing that. Um, right now, we're all fully vaccinated in this room. There's not patient care that's provided anywhere in this building. And so we're not required to wear a mask while we're here, even when we're together. But that could change. We might have to roll back to um, even in non-patient care buildings, even among fully vaccinated people now requiring to be to wear a surgical mask. And the problem is we're just um, we are seeing outbreaks. Uh, we you know not too long ago we might have had a dozen less you know employees that were um, out on a COVID leave of absence at home. Um, but we're on Monday we reported close to 60 of our employees now are having to quarantine at home. And if that number continues to rise, even though you know they might have mild uh, symptoms and they recover nicely at home and it feels just like a cold, uh, we have to quarantine them for seven days. And, uh, and that just puts more and more strain on our organization, our ability to provide care, you know, when we're at about 100% occupancy, but then your staff are going out because they're contracting COVID. Um, you know, that's our, our greatest concern right now. And so that's unfortunately, because I, I love coming over this. I have to wear a mask all day long in my building, but that's why I love coming over to the studio in your building because I can take my mask off, but that may change. So we'll see. Okay, so we have a chat. So will a patient who has a positive COVID test at home and then they go and they're seen at one of our facilities, but not retested at the facility and they're given a prescription and sent home, Will that positive number be included in the county's numbers? So the test is not done at a facility. Um, I don't think so, um, because unless the person self-reported, yeah, if you're if you're at home and you can buy these home testing kits anywhere, Costco's got a huge stack of them when you walk into the the front door. So anybody can buy them. You also get them free from the federal government. So if you take a COVID test at home and you test positive, um, and then you go to um, an urgent care center or a clinic and they don't retest you, um, I, I don't think it gets reported um, at all. So um, our employees that test at home and say it turns up positive, do they come into our employee health and retest? They, no, they, if, if they test positive at home, they're asked to stay at home and then to contact their supervisor at work and contact employee health. And uh, employee health will then monitor them, um, you know, contact them over the course of their seven day quarantine. Um, and then they're able to return to work after seven days without taking a test. So they don't have to take a test and test negative. As long as their symptoms um, have, um, you know, diminished or even if they're not completely resolved, if their symptoms have been improving and they haven't had a fever for 24 hours without, you know, taking uh, ibuprofen or, or Tylenol, um, then they can return to work. Now, it's a good question. I don't know if our employee health department submits that information to the county indicating that, um, you know, we had a positive test. Um, I'll have to find that out. Um, I suspect it might be the case that hospitals do report their employee numbers because um, you, you go on the county's website, our countywide positivity rate is now approaching 6%. So it is on the rise. Um, and I can't imagine that's only based on people that access county testing sites. Right. right. So, yeah, a lot of people are doing the at home testing. So, where is that information going? Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to shift gears, Gary. We've answered all of the COVID questions and we're gonna move into just some other questions that people had. So when will the total cost of the new future facility be released to the public? Sure. 
Um, so we are um, currently still working with our architectural um, consulting firm, RBB Architects. So um, Kevin Morrison and Mark Mertz and myself um, actively working to um, kind of finalize the design, uh, the layout of what that new tower would look like. Um, you know, we've kind of, uh, we definitely based on overwhelming community support and the opinion of our own board, uh, we adopted the single tower option and uh, really we're looking at the nine, a nine story tower. Uh, but the more and more we evaluated it and considered that we do have many of our operating rooms and our uh, what we call a post anesthesia care unit or PACU where you recover. Um, those are largely located in the Mineral King Wing. Uh, and if the law holds up that we can't use, you know, those surgical suites and that PACU, um, even though we do have a lot of surgical suites that are in the East Tower and the Asequia Wing, and uh, so it's not that we wouldn't have surgical capacity, um, but we're kind of exploring maybe going to a 10th uh, floor, so a 10-story tower. And the second story would be all brand new surgical suites and a pre and post uh, recovery area. Uh, if that is the plan that we go with, the, the currently working um, cost, the number is roughly $650 million. So um, I'm, I'm hesitant to just put that number out to the public. Um, I'm comf very comfortable sharing it with all of you, our ambassadors and, and uh, community advisors. Um, but when I, when I go out to the public, I'd really like to take a, a more comprehensive communication where it's not just the, the design and the layout of the building and the cost, but I also have a funding plan to describe you know, all the different components that would create the funding using cash reserves, funds from operations, uh, grants, uh, tax exempt revenue bonds that we would issue, and then uh, fundraising in our local community, and then lastly, uh, a general obligation bond. So I kind of want to have a, a pretty well thought out plan around that. And then I also want to be able to um, have sized the general obligation bond so, um, so that I know exactly what size it needs to be and then uh, what the implications will be to an individual um, taxpayer, uh, property owner. So I don't want to just throw you know this number out there but then it will just trigger tons of questions that I don't yet have answers to. So I'd really kind of like to somewhat wrap a bow around it although I want to leave the door open for community input. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to shut that down. So. Our thought is that we'll complete um, kind of the planning and costing piece in the next few weeks, then move into the uh, funding design and, and the geo bond sizing. And so probably in like mid-September, I would say we're gonna go back on the road, um, Deborah yeah, and I, and, and start, yeah, start meeting back with stakeholders and a broader community audience mm -hmm. um, to really be able to share all of that at the same time. Okay. And I hope we also will have clear direction from the state in terms of what the legislature uh, is thinking around Senate Bill 1953 and an extension of the deadline beyond 2030 and um, you know maybe lowering um, the structural performance category rating that hospitals have to meet because um, that there's a lot of pressure that the California Hospital Association is bringing to the legislature particularly in light of how the pandemic, you know, what it's, unfortunately the financial harm um, that it has caused. Uh, Kaufman Hall, who's a nationally recognized uh, financial advisory firm, was engaged by the California Hospital Association to kind of assess the current financial condition of the roughly 500 hospitals in California and found that 51% of them, including CUIA, uh, is currently operating in the red. Um, and has dipped deeply into their cash reserves. And they projected that uh, California hospitals will probably lose $20 billion um, over this uh, last year and perhaps another $8 billion in 2023. So hopefully, you know, that um, doesn't fall on deaf ears with the legislatures, mm -hmm. that they, you know, they're sympathetic to that and, and supportive of us. 
Okay. Some more to come on that. Yes. Okay, so Gary, in light of the horrible tragedy this week with the school shooting, um, the question came in about what we have in place to protect our patients and our employees in the event of a shooter, an active shooter. And um, can you go into any drills or any kind of processes that we have to protect our community? Sure. Well, first, um, just, you know, I want to express our um, our deepest condolences and thoughts and prayers to not just the families, but the entire state of Texas and, and the nation and, and all the communities, including our community, that have just been devastated by this incomprehensible, horrific act. And I, I just, I, I just, yeah, we, we, we all remain shocked and, and heartbroken and um, and so it's it's hard to even imagine, um, and it just I don't know. It's talking to Daniel, you know, here with young children, um, it just is so personal to everyone. And so, um, unfortunately, it's becoming too commonplace in our society, in our world. And hospitals are not immune. Um, there have been incidences of shooting shootings in hospitals. Um, we do, uh, on our badges, you know, we have all these um, codes. When you hear code blue, we kind of all know, you know, there's a, a patient that's going into cardiac arrest or code red, there might be a fire. Um, code green, uh, we have an elopement of a patient. Well, code silver, uh, when you hear that overhead, it means that they, we have um, potentially um, uh, a hostage situation or a weapons situation and uh, everybody is instructed to stay away uh, from wherever that incident is called and so we routinely run code silver drills um, mostly at the department level um, because you know the the run hide fight uh, response to a threat of that nature uh, varies significantly by the the logistical layout of an individual department. You know the escape routes, and um, and so it's hard to practice um, an active shooter or a code silver at the whole organization level. So we do routinely um, do those at the department level. Um, however, and and it's really not in light of the of the recent um, event, um, but probably just you know continuing to be sensitive to everything going on around us um, I talked to uh, Maribel who oversees our environment of care and, and kind of security and um, and so we are planning uh, for this fall um, to actually do an organization-wide um, drill that will incorporate many of the active shooter training elements in it but um, we're very sensitive to the reaction that it can cause um, with our employees because I, I will tell you um, you know many years ago um, I think throughout the organization we all viewed um, the active shooter videos where we learned about the the run hide fight um, concepts and what to do and then we ran a mock active shooter in the emergency department that was probably a little too real life uh, we had actors come in, and, uh, and, and I don't believe that we gave forewarning to folks that it was going to be. And so you can just imagine oh the gosh. trauma that that caused. And, um, and so that, that was certainly a mistake on our part. Um, it probably is the most, you know, realistic way to test you know somebody's response to an active shooter and did our was our training effective if you tell everybody hey this isn't real it's mock you know you're not going to act the same um, and so you, you want to practice a real life situation when that adrenaline and everything is flowing through you um, but it also yeah it was very traumatizing mm -hmm. and so it's like we we really can't do that so this exercise we're going to do in the fall is more of what we call a tabletop where we know it's all mock we're sitting around describing the situation and it comes to us 
through a script and everything, and and then we react and we respond uh, to that changing drill and the different elements of it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is definitely across the country. It's it's heightened, you know, the the consciousness of of hospital leaders and because um, obviously our, our our primary number one objective is. Um, the safety of our patients and our visitors and our employees and um, and so we want this to be uh, a safe place people are already coming to the hospital with a high level of anxiety and mm -hmm. um, but you want to feel that um, unfortunately just like your schools you you want to feel that when you drop your children off there that uh, you know it's 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 a sanctuary it's it's a safe yeah. place to be and um, but we got to be realistic too and so mm -hmm. we've got to and that's why we have lots of security um, throughout the throughout the organization. Um, they're there, you know, present to deter, um, but also if they need to, to immediately act in the event of a, a code gray, which is, you know, there's maybe a violent um, uh, agitated person or code silver, where you could have a weapon involved um, mm -hmm. to be able to have security there that can respond right away. Yeah. Because nurses are kind of like teachers, you can't run and hide. You have to protect the vulnerable, and a patient is one the of the most, most vulnerable. vulnerable. Yes. You know, they're yes. they're stuck in a bed, they're locked in a room. So, yep. yeah, okay. So, we will we'll have more to come on that when we do the drill in yes. in the fall. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we had a code triage last week that wasn't related to COVID. So, do you want to kind of explain why that was called? Yeah, they, well, they used to be a rare event. Uh, in fact, I remember talking about them what, over the summer. Um, we had called maybe our second, uh, what we call an internal disaster. Uh, so not an external disaster where we might have, you know, a big car wreck or a chemical spill. Or, um, so those do happen, and, and we do call, call code triages for those. And everybody knows what to do in the event uh, that a code triage is called. Um, but this one was actually an internal disaster, um, and it, it, it started on Monday of last week, that over the course of the day, uh, the volume of patients that we were seeing in the emergency department was just continue, continuing to rise. Um, and so we saw 282 patients in the emergency department on Monday. And so at the same time, the hospital was full. Um, and so we were seeing an in increasing number of patients coming to the ED that it was determined that they needed to be admitted. They were acutely ill or injured. We didn't have beds upstairs. And so we decided out of an abundance of caution, we need to call a code triage, which, which then all these different things go into gear and more staff come in and uh, physicians go up on the unit looking for potential discharges. And so at six o'clock Monday night, we called um, a code triage. By Tuesday morning, we woke up to having 73 patients, admitted patients holding in the ED, waiting for a bed to open up. That is a new record for Quia. We, uh, in our entire existence, we've never had 73 patients um, holding in the ED. Um, so the, the code triage continued all throughout Tuesday and our staff, our, our medical staff, our employees did a phenomenal job. Um, in all areas, not, you know, not just nursing and doctors, but you know, respiratory therapy and EVS and dietary and clinical engineering, just everybody just you know, coming um, to help support um, this uh, internal disaster. And so by Wednesday morning, it had calmed down enough um, that we felt we were able to then call off um, the code triage, so kind of spanned from 6 o'clock Monday to about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock Wednesday morning. What is so befuddling is like what caused almost 300 patients to just come to the ED? What caused 73 of them to be admitted? Because since then, the number of admitted patients holding in the ED 
has kind of run in the teens. I mean, today we had 23, mm -hmm. which is an uptick, um, but so it's so unpredictable um, what we're experiencing out there mm -hmm. uh, in the community. But just I want to again commend all of our staff, uh, both medical staff and, and QUI employees. Just um, it's just amazing what they're able to do. So I had to report that information out to a, a group that I was with and I had texted Carrie and said, okay, give me the reasons behind this. And she said, a lot of traumas. So I don't know if it's because everybody's back on the roads, everybody's, you know, kind of yeah. almost semi back to normal, but it's interesting that we're so full. It is, yeah. Um, I, and I, you're right. I mean, is it more people are now active again? Um, you know, are people agitated? Mm -hmm. I mean, just our mental health right now as right. a society, you know, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, and I don't know off the top of my head the nature of the traumas. Right. I mean, we are a designated trauma center, right. so all trauma throughout the entire county comes to Quia. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's all, you know, Visalia based trauma or it just really widespread across the county uh, and every community and city is experiencing a rise in, in uh, injuries and trauma and, and yeah. just are converging on Quia. So I, I think it, it was just, you know, the perfect storm right. uh, last week. So you mentioned that um, we didn't used to call co triages very often. Mm -hmm. And um, other than practicing. In your, in your employment here. Yeah. Do you ever remember a time when, I mean, I know you've never had a pandemic before, but even code triage is being called. Um, yeah, uh, you know, code, it's not uncommon to maybe have three or four code triages in a year, um, but, you know, it's a multi-car pileup in the fog in the winter, and so we expect a number of patients are going to be coming in. Uh, we have had, um, you know, fertilizer spray on farm workers you know, crop dusting or some other, and, uh, and so we need hazmat, and, um, and so, you know, a lot of them, and, and we call a code triage to alert the, the hospital that we are going to have an influx of patients that is above and beyond what would normally come in at all times, and that, again, just to get everybody ready for that. Um, but virtually all of our code triages are external. You know, something's happened in the community and we need to get ready for that. Although I can remember maybe over the last couple of years, we had a major power outage and uh, our cogen engine went down and our generators uh, didn't kick on immediately. And uh, we had blown a fuse, a couple fuses in the cogen plant. And uh, it probably, I think it was in the summer, so it was really hot. And so in that case, we called an internal disaster, a code triage. We also had an event where our computer systems went down for a prolonged period of time. And, uh, you know, they usually, they go down generally planned, you know, and it's scheduled at the wee hours of the morning and were at least disruptive. But we had some major um, issue. We lost a server or something major happened uh, and, and we were down for a few days. So in that instance, we also called the code triage, uh, internal disaster. Um, and we'll, when that happens, we will stand up the command center and uh, all of our directors know to report to the mm -hmm. command center. It's just like automatic, you know, Pavlov's dog and mm -hmm. ring the bell and we all come <laughs> running when it's code triage. Um, but then, you know, it's like, okay, what's the situation? Okay, I need Maria, I need Daniel, Deborah, I don't need you. And, you know, so we adjust the, uh, the response um, to the specific situation. Interesting. And do we, when you call a code triage, does it alert anybody or is it just for us to know only? Uh, do we alert the state? Uh, depending on the nature of it, sure. we'll alert the county. Uh, we might alert fire, police. Um, we have a pretty sophisticated text system. So when a code triage goes out, all of our phones light up. We get text messages um, uh, and, and it keeps us apprised throughout the course of the uh the disaster about what's happening and um so yeah we we, we certainly have come a long way uh over the years and have learned much and and certainly the pandemic you know again there there are 
a number of silver linings that have coming out, come out of it and the ability to respond to long-term disasters. Um, you know, we've never done that. That is unique. I mean, usually a disaster at most lasts a few days. Uh, yeah. When we practice them, they last a few hours, but uh, we've never had one that lasted two and a half years. That's, uh, that's well, if anything, your employees are now very adaptive to change. We yes, can yes. we can change at the drop of a hat. Yes. Okay, so speaking of our employees, are we seeing any kind of relief from this staffing shortage we've been battling? You know, not really. Um, I, I wish I had a different answer. Uh, but we currently have still about 600 open positions across the entire organization. Um, 200 of those 600 are registered nurses. Uh, so we continue to make extensive use of contracted nurses, travelers, um, still continuing to uh, incur a lot of overtime. Um, uh, offering extra shift bonuses to, for nurses working an, an extra shift. And um, that, that has started to decline a little bit, the, the need for that extra shift bonus, but um, it's still in the hundreds of thousands of dollars um, every pay period. Uh, on, a, on a bright spot, uh, we will see uh, a new class of um, nurse graduates. Mm -hmm that'll come out uh, here in the next uh, couple weeks out of COS and, um, and Fresno State and, and other um, nursing programs. And uh, we hope that, uh, in fact, we've made offers to many of them. We actually recruit them while they're still in nursing school. And so we expect a new class will be joining us and they'll be sitting for their boards um, and they'll come on and go through orientation um, and so, it, but it does take a little bit of time to get through that orientation and become a, a confident, um, you know, nurse. And um, but it's still going to take us a while. Uh, and again, you know, not that misery loves company, but we're suffering right along with uh, most other, most every hospital up and down the right. state and across the country that uh, are also experiencing uh, significant shortages in their mm -hmm. workforce. Yeah. So we talk a lot about the reasons why we have turnover, and the question was asked, do you think your turnover is high because you are bringing back remote employees who do not want to come back in person? Have you seen that as a trend? You know, I don't, um, certainly not for nurses, um, and, and that's where we are experiencing the highest level of turnover uh, are among nurses, and, and again, that's what all hospitals statewide are experiencing. There's not that many remote jobs for nurses. Um, there are some, you know, um, our clinical documentation team uh, right downstairs mm -hmm. here. Um, they're nurses that are no longer working at the bedside, and, and actually they've been working remotely. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but it's, it's, I know it's difficult for them because a lot of their job is going up on the unit and interacting with physicians to clarify documentation mm -hmm. and so forth. So. Um, but when we've had you know big surges, we, we have had them work remotely. Um, so we, we do have um, you know certain jobs like uh, medical record coders. Their their jobs are perfect for remote um, work, and uh, and so that's essentially become a permanent um, you know environment for them. They 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 all work from home now, and so. Um, but I, I'd say, you know, the, the turnover in nursing is primarily nurses going to work for uh, travel companies, you know, the, the nurse travel agencies where they can not only maybe make more money, but certainly more variety. They can go, you know, work other places. Um, that's very appealing to a lot of nurses. We are seeing interesting nurses going back and forth, like, Nurses leave Community Regional Medical Center to come to Quia, and then nurses leave Quia to go to Community Re Regional Medical Center. Well, why? Well, for a sign-on bonus. Mm. And so they, um, they get the sign-on bonus, and they do their stint, and then they come back. And so um, there's that going on. Um, you know, and, and that, you know, pre-pandemic reasons nurses live, you know, leave, a, a spouse gets transferred away. Um, you know, a new opportunity comes up, uh, maybe to work in another location, 
Um, so we have we have all that normal turnover going on, but I um, and there are nurses that are leaving the profession mm-hmm. or definitely deciding to leave uh, acute inpatient care where there's the greatest risk of being exposed to viruses like COVID. So uh, nurses wanting to go you know into a different setting um, that maybe is is less risky, might be less demanding. Um, so I don't. I don't really, uh, I, I have actually personally um, talked to a few people, non-nurses, that um, did leave Kuia for a remote job. Interestingly, they, uh, they're working remotely for a Bay Area company mm-hmm. that offered them higher compensation, but is allowing them to continue staying and living in Visalia and working remotely. Mm-hmm. And so that's, yeah, pretty attractive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can go to work for this Bay Area company, you know, make five, ten dollars more an hour, but I can still stay in Visalia and, you know, because their compensation is based on the Bay Area cost of living. They don't necessarily adjust it because, oh, you decided to re- work remotely in Visalia, so we're going to pay you less. So, um, so I have heard, but it's a handful. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have heard, um, you know, people leaving um, uh, Kuia for remote jobs. I mm-hmm. just, um, now that said, you know, we are closely looking at that opportunity and actually have been studying telecommuting, you know, which is essentially working from home. Um, we've been looking at that for a number of years, pre pandemic. Um, and as you see, a lot of companies that had big buildings, you know, in downtown. Uh, San Francisco that most of their employees can all work from home. Well, I don't have to rent that building anymore. I don't have right. to air condition it. I don't have to clean it. I, right. So um, the same thing is true of us, that if we can have employees work from home, um, you know, that, that is a lower cost for us. Um, also helps relieve parking in you know, downtown, which is always a big plus. Um, so it can be a win-win for both us and the employees. So I, I think you'll continue uh, to see us um, explore that more and more. Mm-hmm. We can't discount the toll it's had on people's mental health. Their their um, priorities have changed a lot of, yes. you know, it's like everyone's exhausted. Nurses, non-nurses, we're just right. tired. I think it also, um, it, it certainly helped us appreciate the fragility of life. Mm-hmm. You know, sadly, uh, we've now lost a million people uh, in this country mm-hmm. to COVID. We're probably approaching 2,000 in Tulare County. And, uh, you know, all of us have been touched by COVID in some way. And many of us have lost a a family member or a friend to COVID. And it just makes you rethink your life. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes that's good. You know, what are your priorities in life? And um, so I I think, you know, a lot of turnover in healthcare in any industry is, is a reflection of that, just people rethinking um, what's important. Right. Okay, so we're going to end today with a couple of announcements, and I'll go first to the Healthcare for Today and Tomorrow Committee that has helped us form um, a really cool program that we are kicking off called the Community Resident Housing Program. And you know that um, residents are coming in in the next several weeks to our community, and it's no secret to all of you that there is um, a huge housing shortage, probably because all of these Bay Area people are coming Mm -hmm. and working remote. But it is very difficult for our residents, who many of them have never even visited Tulare County, due to the COVID restrictions and travel restrictions. So they're coming in in the next few weeks and they have no idea where to live. And so we're creating a program where our community members can sign up to house a resident. It's a volunteer, there's no money involved, we will not pay you, but it's a great experience to open your home. And so our residents need a bed, a bathroom, and just a safe place to stay when they come to this area. So if you are interested in hosting a resident, you can reach out to me and I can send you the application. And then we are matching our community members with the residents to try to find the best fits. This is a short-term housing solution. Um, They can stay with you for as short of a time as four weeks, all the way up to a year, depending upon 
the agreement that you make with that resident. But it's a short-term solution. We're really excited. They're coming in and we've got some amazing community members. We've already got a couple who've reached out to me. We've already received an application from a community member who says, yep, my house is open. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited. You know, I've done this for years with the Youth Exchange through Rotary. And one of the differences in this is going to be these people work 60 to 70 hours you a week. Not You're not going to see them, see them huh? very much. <laughs> they just need a safe place to sleep and so if you're interested in that reach out to me and we will get you the information yeah I would just add to that um, so dr. Lori Winston um, who is our designated uh, institutional official so she oversees our entire residency program she made her annual report um, last night to our board and one of our very first slides was the I'll say retention uh, rate so Roughly 45% of all the residents that have graduated from our various programs <clears throat> decided to stay and live and work in our community. And so I think this is just going to help increase that number yeah. even more as we, as a community, demonstrate to our residents just how important they are to us, how much we care about them, yeah. and they're just gonna say, wow, what an amazing community. Yeah. So. And what there's no better way to get them acclimated into the community than to stay with somebody who can introduce them to houses of faith, right. different leaders in the community, different organizations, restaurants. Um, we Somebody shared a story with us that one of our residents had been here for quite a while and did not know that there were grocery stores other than like Foods Co. or something like that, Winco, huh. Winco. And they were like, we didn't know there were other grocery like stores. Winco. And we're like, there's a lot more to buy <laughs> sell you than just one grocery huh. store. But it's just kind of like a, a window yeah. into how much a resident works right. and how little they get to acclimate themselves. But this is gonna be a great program. It I'm is. very excited about it. So if you're interested, reach out to me. So Gary, I'm gonna let you close this with a, a very important um, announcement, something very important that's happening to you and um, your role sure. here at Quia Health. Yeah, um, thank you, Deborah. So as the Chief Executive Officer of Quia Health, um, I report directly to um, the Healthcare District's Board of Directors. Uh, I am the only employee that reports directly to the board and I, I work um, at their pleasure. Um, but I actually have a contract uh, with the organization um, that um, articulates you know, my responsibilities and role and my obligations to the organization and to the board. Um, I'm just uh, approaching the end of my fifth year um, as the CEO and uh, my current contract uh, actually expires um, this coming June 30th, June 30th of 2022. But I'm very um, delighted and honored uh, to announce that uh, last night the, the board uh, formally voted to um, ask me to continue serving as the Chief Executive Officer of Quia Health for at least another three years um, and potentially a fourth year um, that is uh, exercisable at my option. So um, I will be 65 years old on June 30, 2025. Um, so that would be the three years from now. Um, but if I'm having a great time still, um, then I have the option of staying for a fourth year. But that will be my final contract. So I will um, retire at 65 or 66 and step aside um, for um, Quia's um, next CEO. Um, so very excited about that. Um, but I asked the, the board um, if I could take a break um, because I, I want to enter this final contract um, with a lot of vigor and enthusiasm and energy. I want to come into it with a tank full of gas. And for the reasons you just stated, I feel like I'm running close to empty right now. I mean, um, you know, we, we've all been uh, experiencing um, this over the last two and a half years. And, um, but uh, in my 40 years in healthcare now, I think, uh, you know, the most I've ever taken off is a couple weeks just for a vacation. So um, I told them, you know, I'd, I'd really like to 
to just sprint into this next um, contract, final contract, rather than kind of limping into it. So not that I'm, you know, still not um, very enthusiastic and, and energetic, but um, so I've asked the board to give me a two month break, um, a sabbatical of sorts. Um, so I, I would probably, I'd, I would have loved to take three months, which is kind of traditional, um, but there's a lot um, in store for us this fall and I want to be a part of that. So I don't want to miss any of it. So I'm going to take off the months of July and August. Um, I don't know entirely what I'm going to do yet. Uh, my wife and I have thought about a few things that definitely will be visiting uh, family and friends, our parents, um, children, spending a little bit more time than just a weekend maybe with them. Um, so that'll, that'll be nice. Um, during my absence, I've asked two of my executive team members uh, to kind of split the, um, I'll call acting CEO position. So Carrie Nowitzki, who is our chief nursing officer and is in the office right next to mine, um, she will be the acting CEO um, during the month of July. And then she takes some vacation, uh, at which time uh, Mark Mertz, our chief strategy officer, uh, will then be the acting CEO uh, for the month of August. So um, I've told them not to make any big changes. If somebody came along and offered us $3 billion for the hospital, I would say take it. Um, but uh, aside from that, you know, um, not that they're just, you know, filling the seat because we know this is a very dynamic industry. It's a very dynamic organization. But fortunately, they'll be surrounded by a very capable, talented uh, executive team, uh, a very dedicated, committed um, board of directors. And so they'll, they'll be well supported um, over those couple months. And I've started announcing um, this uh, to many different groups. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who have um, expressed, um, you know, congratulations. I, I did have a couple people, including my own personal doctor this morning, offered his condolences, but it was very tongue in cheek. Um, but, uh, but thank you all for your expressions of support and encouragement and congratulations and, um, and thank you for supporting, uh, my, my break. So, well, when I, you say you're taking a break, is it going to be a fake break where you're still going to be emailing and calling and coming up you with know, projects? You know, that, that would be me. I know. That would be my nature. Yeah. Because um, I do that when I'm on vacation. I don't disconnect. Um, but I've actually told Doug Leeper that I want him to disconnect my email and shut off my access to it. So it's already causing me a panic attack of yeah. sorts. Yeah. Cause um, and I'm even tempted, do I shut off my Visalia Times Delta subscription and not read the local paper anymore and just pretend that I left the country? I guess I could do that, but um, that's the advice that's been given to me by many. As uh, Dave Francis, our board president, said, Gary, leave town and don't come back for two months. And I, I just, I can't even comprehend that. I can't yeah. just, um, so we'll see, but uh, I won't be here in July and August. So um, I'll, I'll ask one of uh, our executives to kind of pinch hit for me yeah. for um, our two community yeah, huddles they that will, will take um, place. We'll do, Carrie will be joining us in July and Mark will join us in August. That's great. And you'll be here in June. And so I'm sure you'll have a lot more to tell us about it then. But um, it's been a I, hello. No other CEO can say they've gone through what you've gone through the last five years. And so Yep. We're glad you're just taking a break because yes. um, obviously CEOs across the country have been in my very same shoes. Right. And um, right. last Friday I was in uh, Monterey for a district hospital leadership forum uh, executive committee meeting, and there were um, CEOs from five other hospitals that were there um, with us. And um, it's it's amazing how similar our stories are and mm -hmm. our experiences. Um, we're the largest district hospital, so our scale is certainly reflective of that, but it's it's all relative. I mean, what they're experiencing, I, I could have had Donna Hefner, the CEO of Sierra View sitting here. You know, I could have had um, Pete Delgado of Salinas uh, Valley Memorial Hospital sitting here, and they would have probably answered the questions exactly the same, speaking yeah. about their hospitals, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, Gary, let's go ahead and end it. Yeah.
Well, I'll just end on that positive <laughs> note. And, and again, thank you to all of you for continuing to join in um, now monthly and appreciate all your great questions. Um, thanks for mixing it up a little bit uh, with COVID and non-COVID, but uh, I still, I welcome the COVID questions too, because it, uh, it is still, you know, ever changing and certainly our circumstance. Uh, we now have not only BA.2, we have BA.2.12.1 is the uh, new variant that has emerged on the scene. So, um, yeah, so always uh, new stuff to report, but thank you all for um, your support of Quia Health and, uh, and, and for being in this role as, as uh, one of our, our community representatives. So thank you, and I hope you all have a great Memorial Day weekend. Take care.